self hash. Um, hi, welcome to the first event of the Spring Holloway readings. I'm Jeffrey G. O'Brien, and I co curate the series with Jane Gregory, sitting over there next to Claudia. Um, we're really excited to have Claudia here tonight, and her, the power and reach of her work is clearly visible in this room. Um, is everyone comfortable? Um, I just want to tell you about the other readings this semester before we get into tonight's proceedings. Um, so the very next week, on Wednesday the 25th, Peter Gizzi will be here at the same time, 6.30. And then on um, the 18th of March, Fred Moten will be here. And I hope, I'm not sure if it's been worked out yet, that he will also um, be um, presenting in the Mixed Blood series and presenting a paper earlier in the day at 4.30. Um, before his reading that evening. And then finally, April 8th, we have Fanny Howe coming to us as well. Um, tonight, before Claudia reads, we will hear from our own Joshua Anderson. And I'm going to introduce him. And then after he's read, Evan Claiborne will introduce Claudia. And before we go into the poetry itself, I just want to say one last thing, which is that the Holloway series wants to mark the recent series of efforts going on digitally and locally in poetry communities to make them safer, inclusive spaces for people of all genders, especially the most vulnerable. And we join here in those efforts and assert our solidarity with them and with fostering joyful respect for difference of any kind. Now let me say a few words about Joshua Anderson's poetry. It's explicitly about poetry, about what it can know and do, if it can be said to do anything, about where and when it takes place, if it does, and about the temporality and body English of reading it. It is therefore often inexplicitly about everything else, and relies heavily on words like something, somewhere, what, that, this, and on other kinds of disappearance, marked by terms like gone, dissolution, and most frequently away. Dictic pronouns come unmoored from their context and then are going, going, gone. This can sound a lot like Ashbery's, say, the spiritualized vagueness of three poems, or Clepsydra, in which lines mostly record the time passing through them. Here are two of Joshua's. It is only when one realizes that this occurs that when, somewhere along the way, it has become. But what happens in poetry's carefully established vagueness does not stay in vagueness for Anderson. Often it reaches out to touch what then feel like hyper-particularities, liquor stores and augusts, moving from somewhere's ether to a tongue on a body. But even this oscillation between the poem and the world it has far away, as he puts it, has to be traced. Quote, to touch a particular crack is to trace it or to fight the urge to trace it, and to call into question the propriety of that point at which one feels one should stop touching it, touch it with something else, or jump to another crack. It depends on what or if you are looking for and what and whether or not you can trace over it in something like the reverse. Anderson calls this a critique of the surface, a parody of logic, of collision mechanics, of desire and fetish that ends up exceeding parody or stopping well short of it. Ashbery, reviewing Stein's stanzas in meditation in 1959, would also be describing Anderson's language when he said that it was made up, quote, made up, quote, almost entirely of colorless connecting words such as where, which, these, of, not, have, about, and so on. Though now and then Miss Stein throws in an orange, a lilac, or an Albert to remind us that it really is the world, our world, that she has been talking about. This way of happening Ashbery praises in Stein while describing his own practice is also why, must be why, Anderson can write a line as colorless as, quote, this must be why, and follow it with, quote, I so often address the world. Please welcome Joshua Anderson. Thank you, Jeffrey. I uh, would like to thank Jeffrey and Jane and Claudia and everyone for being here tonight, for having me. Um, I feel very honored. <clears throat> this first poem, actually all the poems I'm going to read tonight are from a small book that I've put together that I've been making at Bay Area bookstores sell for me. Um, <laughs> it's The first poem in it is called About Certain Kinds of Poetry, and I wrote it after I bought Jeffrey's last book, um, People on Sunday. It was a Sunday, and I went to Dolores Park and I sat and I read that book. 
and then I wrote this poem. So this is for Jeffrey. About certain kinds of poetry. It is only when one realizes that this occurs that when somewhere along the way it has become apparent like a leaking action, a small piece of it, has come to parody sense or, to put it another way, has been given another different way of doing something up to and against its own purpose. Because, and then it's gone, it is for an impending evening, it is always behind and ahead of itself, defying itself as such, remembering insofar as this is an act of disillusion. Having received the quality of palpability in light of its object's curious lack, it suggests that suggestion is both its verb and more than that, that that tilting, leaning, nudging, blinking dyxis points to a series of resonance circles that either both nest in and emanate from that which it should not be in the business of isolating, or lets go of the value of location, while wanting more than anything to be relieved of the burden of description through the resistance of the one for whom said realization has happened to occur. And so we are seen to do nothing like slip away, relentlessly, away from something. To feel this unfortunate, to feel this unfortunate acceleration at the end of one's day gives the illusion to the idea that the verb becomes my moment of opportunity in regards to the task of disclosing the phylogenic possibilities of the flow produced by language and that writing at a normal pace seems slow, deliberate, succinct, and that processing speeds are suitable analogs for what I've come to call the translation of itself into poetry, <coughs> and that ands and commas touch up the universe, diverging things tinily, not linking them. I'm going to move this up a little bit. Can, you, can everyone hear if I don't <coughs> lean forward? I so often address the world, quote, when you think you don't do anything, you do something through it. Its towardness is essential to it. Poetry as a mode of thinking then has everything that it isn't essential to it, unquote. This must be why I so often address the world. Adjective possibilities. Traffic wants to have a physics, Memory desires a schema. Knowing is neither a bulimia nor a nymphomania. That fluid's pool, or congeal, is simple and rife with objective possibilities, and thought wants to be smoke. The level of language. Having spent that time, as it were, engaged in a verb other than, however, performed an activity whose result was analogous to that of something like something having cost him. What was now to be a lack, to be defined by the fact that it was not there specifically because it could have or might have had things been different. At the level of language, then, it might be seen that a truncation works to highlight the inevitability of a sentence, that the subject is the predicate of the predicate, and that both are predicated on the set of conditions we commonly refer to as some sort of system, but that, again, and more importantly, all the possible senses of where the sentence or line was going in the first place both occlude the need for an object and call into question the potential of language to do so. At the level of wherever it is that I am tired, wherever I smell, my body has smells, I smell my body's odors, or where I intend towards grumpiness or misanthropy, where I grumble. My dealings at the level of language are provided for by the scrape of smoke. <clears throat> Critique of the surface number one. Everything is delineated by cracks, caused by something else, multiple somethings else. Things like impacts, two sudden changes in temperatures, too many other cracks already, Smashings together caused by loosenings, suspensions called into question by suggestions of a causality at the end of its rope, a comprisal that is for all intents and purposes. To touch a particular crack is to trace it, or to fight the urge to trace it, and to call into question the propriety of that point at which, that point at which one feels one should stop touching it, touch it with something else, 
or jump to another crack. It depends on what or if you are looking for and what, and whether or not you can trace over it in something like the reverse, or whether the surface is constantly rising, and from a seeking vantage, one might understand the zigzagging effect of such a reversal. Critique of the surface number two, or how the surface of her body dispels my attempts to know it as such. I am either somewhere in the ether or a tongue tracing her body. Everything else is the mode by which I do everything but write poetry. For whom the decision is the act. Poet of the thing never being the thing, neither service, nor memory, nor figure. Poet of calling the not things poems or memories, or whatever they are. Of remembering the significance of what they are up and against. All of the what's they're not like. The white breast that humiliates me like the anger that can never be visceral. Like the ghosts that actually animate my limbs, my not images of God my excess of truncations that fail to dissolve, that make of themselves a me that makes of them gods, or the happy ghost that is glad to have discovered the divinity of my arm, for whom the decision to punch is the act of punching, the actual punch. The happy ghost remembers and knows through remembering the tingle of knuckles before, during, and after said punch. But all the ghosts are happy, happy to traverse the surfaces, and in so doing, defile them. This one's called The Impression. I don't like the title, but I couldn't think of anything else. I was under the impression that what was said was meant in a certain way. I took various contextual data, oral signifiers. I read the tone, the mood, the pacing, and concluded, in a faith as good or better than any other, and concluded, through the swift and subtle machinations of well-trained logic, that the response that I had calculated in the deftly split second it took to perform the above-mentioned calculations, all without thinking, all without knowing whether or not I was thinking, that said response was reasonable, humorous, worthy of its origins, utterance, and the verbal event into which it was to be inserted. And this is why I was wrong. Adjacency. Catching a quick glimpse of that which I choose to ignore does not negate the meaning of the word ignore, nor the act of ignoring, but qualifies the world as a bunch of objects without clearly delineated edges, leading this way and that according to a metric of general differentiation. So, the cars are all next to each other in a certain way, and the lawns and the sidewalks and buildings in which reside people who are alternately next to them all and who are convinced of this ineffable adjacency to the extent that they choose to ignore and bleed the bleeding in and out of themselves into everything else. The seven to the three. August trickles down access roads, the jaggedy tops of thin plaint, backyard fences spelling out childhoods and futures. It's this idea about something represented by a faraway-ness, something about liquor stores and strip malls being very much like memories, about steering away from language and a desire to steer away from language. Everything is for that reason anathema. One is not guilty of that which is for all intents and purposes. One is simply, and more than likely, overwhelmed by what, to him, has added up to be the world. Having a quality of essential similarity to something other than itself, something worthy of other words, words other than its own. An honest reaction to the world is worthy of poetry that will never comprise it. If there were no world, there would be no poetry, so do not make of something that which it isn't. Instead, make of poetry like beads of condensation, connecting tiny rivers on some pane of glass, some deep surface, some ineffable texture. Something like a choir of something like angels might articulate something like that which immediately slips away. 
something who's slipping away, one realizes is the substance of the act of something being something like sung and sung into viscous existence, and simply not something like metaphysical or concrete, but sliding about slowly on a scale from one to ten, oscillating something like in and around anywhere from the seven to the three. And I've got one more poem for the evening. It's not from this collection, and it was fortuitous that Jeffrey mentioned the colorlessness of this work, because the next zine that I'll be putting together is called Colors More Colors, and this is the poem where it got its title, Colors More Colors. We might go so far as to say all sorts of things about what we hope for the future, the warm feeling of possibilities, we might stay for the gray of the underclouds between the hills and the bay. We very well might make the cover of a magazine someday. More shades of gray or colors, more colors, more colors. I'll find myself half asleep in the grass, the sun touching my clavicle, my skin wanting to get out, or at the ballet. Or say, stay for a while yet, stay so we can see your body with our fingers, stay in our bed with our bodies. Our bodies a bouquet of colors, more colors. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Claudia Rankin is the author of five collections of poetry, including Citizen and American Lyric, published in 2014, which was the finalist for the National Book Award and is the first two-category finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in both criticism and poetry. She has written the plays Provenance of Beauty, a South Bronx travelogue, commissioned by the Foundry Theater, and Existing Conditions, co-authored with Casey Llewellyn, and has also produced a number of videos in collaboration with John Lucas. Rankin is co-editor of American, Poets, American Women Poets in the 21st Century, series with Wesleyan University Press, and The Racial Imaginary with Fence Books. A recipient of awards and fellowships from the Academy of American Poets, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Lennon Foundation, Poets and Writers, and the National Endowment for the Arts. In 2013, Rankin was elected a Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. She teaches at Pomona College. There's so much praise that I'd like to pay out of my admiration for Claudia Rankin's work, so much I'd like to say about her writing, so many lines and passages I'd like to quote, but since we're fortunate enough tonight to have her here to read her work for herself, uh, I thought instead of quoting her, I would offer an appreciation by way of quotations of others, which she's included in her books. Don't Let Me Be Lonely, published in 2004, bears an epigraph from Ima Césaire's Notebook of a Return to the Native Land. The quotation speaks to Rankin's sense of the stakes of both the aesthetic and of being a person sharing the world, Mrs. Césaire. And most of all, beware, even in thought, of assuming the sterile attitude of the spectator. For life is not a spectacle. A sea of grief is not a proscenium. A man who wails is not a dancing bear. Rankin's work often engages in documentation, might be thought of as a poetry of witness. But her attention to the world is not sterile or passive. It is involved, responsive to the back and forth relations, and at times harmful transgressions between public contexts and personal so-called private experience. The interrelation, this interrelation, is at play in the subtitle shared by Don't Let Me Be Lonely and Citizen, that is, an American lyric. Rankin's lyric is one that situates presentation of a self within the social a thinking of poetry in transactional terms of intimacy, reciprocity, and recognition, as she discusses at the end of Don't Let Me, Don't Let Me Be Lonely, quoting Paul Salon's claim, I cannot see any basic difference between a handshake and a poem. 
And yet, Rankin also documents how the shared world is not lived in in the same way by various selves who move through it. Citizen addresses 21st century racism in both its everyday microaggressions and still frequent macroaggressions. This work speaks of contemporary black and minority experiences confronting a double bind of erasure and hypervisibility. As in Zora Neale Hurston's expression, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. First quoted in an essay dealing with Serena Williams, and later represented in Glenn Ligon's background blotting stencil artwork. I could have done the entire thing with uh, the visual artworks that are reproduced and the other visuals that are reproduced in Ligon's work, but I went with quotations. <coughs> At the same time, in the same breaths, Rankin's work is urgent and important for its insistence upon the responsibility of people of whiteness. As she quotes from Franz Fanon, it is the white man who creates the black man. Much of the book is comprised of a series of vignettes where racism is exemplified not so much as a systemic abstraction, though it is thought through at this level too, but as concrete behaviors, especially uses of language, among individual persons in everyday social interactions. For me, as a white person, reading Citizen is stirring and difficult. I find myself feeling for, as, with, about, responding, how could they, how could anyone, how that must, who wouldn't, what would I, haven't I too. Yet the Fanon quotation continues, but it is the black man who creates. On the same page, Rankin quotes James Baldwin, this endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity, human authority, contains for all its horror something very beautiful. The presentation of the self as in a handshake or a poem offers not only an opportunity for recognition, but also for response. This is one of the key values I find in Rankin's work. It is not didactic in the sense of containing a moral, but in the sense of being moral, affording you, indeed confronting you, with something to learn from, as well as learn about. And the book explicitly opens the question as to what different readers with different experiences and racial positions may have to learn from such representations and interrogations. Rankin quotes later in Citizen, the purpose of art, James Baldwin wrote, is to lay bare the questions hidden by the answers. He might have been channeling Dostoevsky's statement that we have all the answers, it is the questions we do not know. Rankin's labor is of such questioning an additive attitude that does not reconcile to past trauma, may not resolve the present and faces a difficult future, yet still responds, yes and, as she puts it, hoping for increased consciousness to continue to live, to be able of response by way of a tactic of engaged adjustment. I'll close by allowing myself to quote from Citizen's final lines. Did you win? It wasn't a match, it was a lesson. It is my pleasure and an honor to welcome Claudia Rankin. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> I would thank you so much for that. I, I'm really glad I did that, because I often think of this book as a kind of archival project, so it's nice that you, you did that. And it, it's um, a great honor to, to read with Joshua. That was a fantastic reading. And thank you to Jeffrey and Jane for having me, and all of you. Thank you all. I, it's, it's very moving for me to um, see you all here, because I feel that you, I, I'm sure you love me, but I know you didn't come for me. I know you came for this subject. And because um, you showing, you showing, you're showing up for this, it makes me feel um, heartened. 
that there are other ways in which we can show up, but this is one of the ways in terms of discussing what needs to be discussed. I'm going to read backwards in this book, I think. I, had, I actually had a request to read a poem. I was like that. Because it takes away the um, choice. <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. <laughs> um, I live in Claremont, and we live um, at the base of the St. Gabriel Mountains. And I have a dog named Sammy, and I walk that dog whenever I can in the mountains. And I walk with my friend Jen, and one day I said to Jen, um, I was working on this, so it was a couple of years ago, and I said, you know, Jen, I want you to tell me a story where you know, you know for sure, that what you're doing, you're doing because you're a white woman. And, and so it's two and a half miles up to the gazebo, and so for two and a half miles, Jen told me different stories, and for one reason or another, I'm like, no, Jen, I think you would do that anyway. And this went on for a while. And by the time we got to the gazebo, I sort of gave up on Jen. Jen is not going to be able to tell me a story. <laughs> but then, on our way down, Jen said to me, well, you know, I do have a story, but it, I didn't think of it because it's relevant when I'm on the East Coast. Because in California, we, we're in this car culture, so we can privatize our, our downtime and private space. And um, so she said, you know, when I'm in the East Coast and um, I'm on the train or the bus, or, and I see a black man sitting and the seat next to him is empty, I sit in that seat. And I said, but Jen, I do that too. So that, does that mean that I also am a white woman? <laughs> <laughs> On the train, the woman standing makes you understand there are no seats available. And in fact, there is one. Is the woman getting off at the next stop? No. She would rather stand all the way to Union Station. The space next to the man is the pause in a conversation you are suddenly rushing to fill. You step quickly over the woman's fear, a fear she shares. You let her have it. The man doesn't acknowledge you as you sit down because the man knows more about the unoccupied seat than you do. For him, you imagine it is more like breath than wonder. He has had to think about it so much, you wouldn't call it thought. When another passenger leaves his seat and the standing woman sits, you glance over at the man. He's gazing out the window into what looks like darkness. You sit next to the man on the train, bus, in the plane, waiting room, anywhere. He could be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to, adjacent to, alongside. You don't speak unless you are spoken to, and your body speaks to the space you fill, and you keep trying to fill it, except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you, not to you. Where he goes, the space follows him. If the man left his seat before Union Station, you would simply be a person in a seat on the train. You would cease to struggle against the unoccupied seat when, where, why the space won't lose its meaning. You imagine the man, if the man spoke to you, he would say, it's okay, I'm okay, you don't need to sit here. You don't need to sit and you sit and look past him into the darkness, the train is moving through a tunnel. All the while, the darkness allows you to look at him. Does he feel you looking at him? You suspect so. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? The soft gray green of your cotton coat touches the sleeve of him. 
You are shoulder to shoulder, though standing, you could feel shadowed. You sit to repair whom, who. You erase that thought. And it might be too late for that. It might forever be too late or too early. The train moves too fast for your eyes to adjust to anything beyond the man, the window, the tile tunnel, its slick darkness. Occasionally, a white light flickers by like a displaced sound. From across the aisle tracks room harbor world, a woman asks a man in the rows ahead if he would mind switching seats. She wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you don't hear, you can't see. It's then the man next to you turns to you. And as if from inside his own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, you'll tell them we're traveling as a family. The, the ending of that piece, um, Lauren Ballant um, and I argued over that. <laughs> because she said it was, and I don't necessarily disagree with her, she said, you know, it's so normative to present the family as a, as a solution. And you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, give me another solution, and then I, <laughs> then I won't do that. <laughs> so. She didn't give me another solution, so I did that. <laughs> the way this book was made, it, it was a community project in every way. I, um, I literally called up friends and asked them to share their stories with me. And in... Uh, in California, I have a friend, he's a lawyer. And um, I invited him over to dinner and I said, um, I said I would make him dinner if he would tell me about interactions he'd had with the police in LA. And so we had a deal. And he came over for dinner. And his wife came with him. And what was amazing is she had never heard any of the stories he told me. So she was sitting across from me at the dinner table, and you could see the shock on her face. So this, this piece was made up of, of those stories. I knew whatever was in front of me was happening, and then the police vehicle came to a screeching halt in front of me, like they were setting up a blockade. Everywhere were flashes, a siren sounding, and a stretched out roar. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Then I just knew. And you're not the guy, and still you fit the description, because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. I left my client's house knowing I would be pulled over. I knew, I just knew. I opened my briefcase on the passenger seat just so they could see. Yes, officer rolled around on my tongue, which grew out of a bell that could never ring because its emergency was a tolling I was meant to swallow. In a landscape drawn from an ocean bed, you can't drive yourself sane. So angry, you are crying. You can't drive yourself sane. This motion wears a guy out. Our motion is wearing you out. And still, you're not that guy. Then flashes, a siren, a stretched out roar. And you're not the guy, and still you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. I must have been speeding. No, you weren't speeding. I wasn't speeding. You didn't do anything wrong. Then why are you pulling me over? Why am I pulled over? Put your hands where they can be seen. Put your hands in the air. Put your hands up. 
Then you are stretched out on the hood, then cuffed. Get on the ground now. Each time it begins in the same way, it doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Flashes, a siren, the stretched out roar. Maybe because home was a hood the officer could not afford, not that a reason was needed. I was pulled out of my vehicle, a block from my door, handcuffed and pushed into the police vehicle's back seat, the officer's knees pressing into my collarbone, the officer's warm breath vacating a face, creased into the smile of its own private joke. Each time it begins in the same way, it doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Go ahead and hit me, motherfucker, fled my lips, and the officer did not need to hit me. The officer did not need anything from me except the look on my face on the drive across town. You can't drive yourself sane. You're not insane. Our motion is wearing you out. And you're not the guy. This is what it looks like. You know this is wrong. This is not what it looks like. You need to be quiet. This is wrong. You need to close your mouth now. This is what it looks like. Why are you talking if you haven't done anything wrong? And you're not the guy and still you fit the description because there is only one guy who's always the guy fitting the description. In a landscape drawn from an ocean bed, you can't drive yourself sane. So angry, you can't drive yourself sane. The charge the officer decided on was exhibition of speed. I was told after the fingerprinting to stand naked, I stood naked. It was only then I was instructed to dress, to leave, to walk all those miles back home. And still you're not the guy, and still you fit the description, because there's only one guy who's always the guy fitting the description. The thing that um, I found out was that in one of his stories, he got, you know, he got this charge exhibition of speed, and apparently it means drag racing. So, like, a 40-year-old man is going to be drag racing, you know, the father of two. But, but he said, he told me that they actually do that so that you can throw it out. Because once they've realized they've made a mistake, they can't say I've made a mistake. So they give you something that you can then bring to the court and get thrown out. So he did get it. So the big news, probably only for me, I guess, is that Serena Williams is um, ending her boycott um, at Indian Wells. Um, so in 2001, you know, I only just the other day made that connection that it was to, it was after September 11th. She went to, um, she and her sister played in Indian Wells, which is not far from where I live in California. And um, <coughs> her Venus had to pull out, and then Serena was in the final, and the crowd turned into one of those mob crowds and started um, yelling, you know, nigger, la 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 la. So Serena won, but then she and her sister decided they would never play at Indian Wells again. Um, and so for years, people have said that Serena was petty <laughs> for continuing this boycott, partly because, you know, she's a big draw. They make money when she plays. And um, so recently she, she decided that she's now, this year, in, in case you want to go, in March, um, playing at Indian Wells for the first time. And one of the things that was very interesting to me in her statement in Time magazine was that she said that she had made a decision to play at Indian Wells again. But it wasn't because she doesn't, you know, I'm saying she said, she didn't say any of this. I'm interpreting. <laughs> Just want you to know. Um, but she said that she um, was going to play the Indian Wells 
because, I don't know if you heard this, but late last year there was a Russian guy, Russian Federation guy, who referred to the Williams sisters as the William brothers. And he was um, organizing the Olympics <laughs> and, um, and various events. And so the, the Tennis Association fined him. They actually made him pay like $25,000. Um, and, they, and they suspended him. So Serena said that she was going to play at Indian Wells because the WTA supported her in that situation. And I found that interesting because she is not <coughs> saying that she's going to Indian Wells because she trusts that the same thing won't happen again. She's saying she's going to Indian Wells because she will have institutional backing if it happens again. So I found it was, you know, she, she didn't talk about institutional backing or public trust or any of that, <laughs> but <laughs> it made me think about that. What does a victorious or defeated black woman's body in a historically white space look like? Serena and her big sister Venus Williams brought to mind Zora Neale Hurston's I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. Hurston's statement has been played out on the big screen by Serena and Venus. They win sometimes, they lose sometimes, they've been injured, they've been happy, they've been sad, ignored, booed mightily, see Indian Wells, which both sister have boycotted since 2001. They've been cheered, and through it all, and evident to all, were those people who were enraged that they were there at all. Graphite against a sharp white background. For years you attribute to Serena Williams a kind of resilience appropriate only for those who exist in celluloid. Neither her father, nor her mother, nor her sister, nor Jehovah her God, nor Nike Camp could shield her ultimately from people who felt her black body didn't belong on their court, in their world. From the start, many made it clear Serena would have done better struggling to survive in the two-dimensionality of a millet painting, rather than on their tennis court. Better to put all that strength to work in the fantasy of her working the land, rather than be caught up in the turbulence of our ancient dramas, like a ship fighting a storm in a Turner seascape. The, um, the project of this book began um, as an exploration of intimacy. You know, everyone always says, oh, you wrote this book about race, but I thought that I was writing a book about intimacy. Mm -hmm. And what it means um, to have a friend or a colleague or, or just the guy at the corner when you go get a baby. <coughs> do something, or say something, that intentionally or not, intentionally, is meant to erase you, or, or point out the desire to erase you. And so I, I called up my, my friends, and I asked them to, to tell me a story of a moment when they were surprised. You know, you're going about your life. And somebody you like, I mean, I'm not talking about Fox News. I'm, I'm talking about, your, these are your people. This is your world. And then suddenly, something gets said or something gets done. So I'll read a few of those. You're in the dark, in the car, watching the black tarred street being swallowed by speed. He tells you his dean is making him hire a person of color, 
when there are so many great writers out there. You think maybe this is an experiment, and you are being tested or retroactively insulted, or you have done something that communicates this is an okay conversation to be having. Why do you feel comfortable saying this to me? You wish the light would turn red or a police siren would go off so you could slam on the brakes, slam into the car ahead of you, fly forward so quickly both your faces would suddenly be exposed to the wind. As usual, you drive straight through the moment with the expected backing off of what was previously said. It is not only that confrontation is headache producing, it is also that you have a destination that doesn't include acting, like this moment isn't inhabitable, hasn't happened before, and the before isn't part of the now, as the night darkens and the time shortens between where we are and where we are going. One of the things that's funny about that story is that, you know, obviously I know who that person is, and it's somebody whose work I really love. And it's, you know, I really had to show up in myself to continue to teach the work, because I don't want to be a petty, small person. But it was, but it was a negotiation I had to do, because um, I like the work. And it's unfortunate. You're rushing to meet a friend in a distant neighborhood of Santa Monica. The friend says, as you walk towards her, you are late, you nappy-headed hoe. What did you say? You ask. Though you have heard every word. This person has never before referred to you like this in your presence. Never before code switched in this manner. What did you say? She doesn't, perhaps physically cannot, repeat what she has just said. Maybe the content of her statement is irrelevant, and she only means to signal the stereotype of black people time by employing what she perceives to be black people language. Maybe she is jealous of whoever kept you and wants to suggest you are nothing or everything to her. Maybe she wants to have a belated conversation about Don Imus and the woman basketball team he insulted with this language. You don't know. You don't know what she means. You don't know what response she expects from you, nor do you care. For all your previous understandings, suddenly incoherence feels violent. You both experience this cut which she keeps insisting is a joke, a joke stuck in her throat. And like any other injury, you watch it rupture along its suddenly exposed suture. Someone in the audience asked the man promoting his new book on humor, what makes something funny? His answer is what you expect, context. After a pause, he adds that if someone said something, like about someone and you were with your friends, you would probably laugh. But if they said it out in public where black people could hear what was said, you might not, probably would not. Only then do you realize you are among the others out in public and not among friends. I'm going to read one of these because um, <coughs> a friend of mine is a white guy, and he keeps saying to me, but well, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> what's, what's up with that? <laughs> In line at the drugstore, I finally, it's finally your turn. And then it's not as he walks in front of you and puts his things on the counter. The cashier says, sir, she was next. 
When he turns to you, he is truly surprised. Oh my God, I didn't see you. You must be in a hurry, you offer. No, 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 I really didn't see you. I did not make that up. <laughs> I actually, there's, there's, there's a, one of these moments that I, I'm going to tell you because it's not in the book. But I, um, I was on the plane and I was traveling and my husband, I'm going to blame this on my husband. My husband said to me, um, you know, if you, if you go and look at your ticket, you have the option of upgrading your ticket for like 200 bucks. You should do that. Because I was going to the East Coast. And so I did, I upgraded my ticket, I was in first class, I, and the way it was organized, there was one, two, three, four in first class, and then the doors, and then <coughs> five, six, seven, eight. So I was in row four, and then, you have to get this in your head, yeah. We got then it. the doors, and then, all right. So we arrive at JFK, and it means that I am the first one up. And then the person in row five is also the first one up. So we come out together, and they've opened the door. And he says to me, thank you. <laughs> and I say, you're welcome. <laughs> but then I leave. I start walking up the door. <laughs> so he says, don't you work for the airline? And I say, not today. <laughs> and he says, but you do work for the airline. And I say, no. And he says, oh, I see. <laughs> what I really should have said was, not serving you today. <laughs> My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. They will never forget that we are named. What is that memory? The days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind. It looked like we rescued ourselves, were rescued. Then there are these days, each day of our adult lives. They will never forget our way through these brothers, each brother, my brother, dear brothers, my dearest brothers, dear heart. Your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets, and as yet I do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. The hearts of my brothers are broken. If I knew another way to be, I would call up a brother, I would hear myself saying, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. <clears throat> On the tip of a tongue, one note following another is another path, another dawn where the pink sky is the bloodshot of struck, of sleepless, of sorry, of senseless, shush. Those years of and before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling, of one in three, two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony, accumulate into the hours, inside our lives where we are all caught hanging the rope inside us the tree inside us its roots our limbs a throat sliced through and when we open our mouth to speak blossoms oh blossoms no place coming out brother dear brother that kind of blue the sky is the silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call if I called, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up, don't hang up. My brother hangs up, though he's there. I keep talking, the talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot, is it cold, are you cold? It does get cool, is it cool, are you cool? 
my brother is completed by sky. The sky is a silence. Eventually, he says, it is raining, it is raining down. It was raining, it stopped raining, it is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there. He's there, but he's hung up, though he's there. Goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me, though the waiting may be the call of goodbyes. <coughs> So I am going to read um, one last thing. Some years there exists a wanting to escape, you floating above your certain ache. Still the ache coexists, call that the imminent you. You are you even before you grow into understanding you are not anyone, worthless, not worth you. Even as your own weight insists, you are here fighting off the weight of non-existence. And still this life parts your lids. You see you seeing your extending hand as a falling wave. I, they, he, she, we, you turn only to discover the encounter to be alien to this place. Wait. The patience is in the living Time opens out to you. The opening between you and you occupied, zoned for an encounter. Given the histories of you and you, and always, who is this you? The start of you each day, a presence already. Hey you, slipping down, burying the you buried within. You are everywhere and you are nowhere in the day. The outside comes in. <coughs> then you, hey you, overheard in the moonlight, overcome in the moonlight. Soon you are sitting around publicly listening when you hear this. What happens to you doesn't belong to you, only half concerns you. He's speaking of the legionnaires in Claire Denis' film, Both Travai. And you are pulled back into the body of you receiving the nothing gaze. The world out there insisting on this, on, that this only half concerns you. What happens to you doesn't belong to you, only half concerns you. It's not yours, not yours only. And still a world begins its furious erasure. Who do you think you are saying I? to me. You nothing. You nobody. You. A body in the world drowns in it. Hey you. All our fevered history won't instill insight, won't turn a body conscious, won't make that look in the eyes say yes. Though there is nothing to solve, even as each moment is an answer. Don't say I if it means so little, holds the little, forming no one. You're not sick. You're injured. You ache for the rest of life. How to care for the injured body, the kind of body that can't hold the content it's living. And where is the safest place when that place must be some place other than in the body? Even now, your voice entangles this mouth, whose words are here as pulse, strumming, shut out, shut in, shut up. You cannot say. A body translates its you. You there. 
Ayu, even as it loses the location of its mouth. When you lay your body in the body, entered as if skin and bone were public places. When you lay your body in the body, entered as if you're the ground you walk on. You know no memory should live in these memories, becoming the body of you. You slow all existence down with your call, detectable only as sky. The night's yawn absorbs you as you lie down at the wrong angle to the sun, ready already to let go of your hand. Wait with me. Though the waiting wait up might take until nothing whatsoever was done. To be left, not alone, the only wish. To call you out, to call out you. <clears throat> Who shouted you? You shouted you. You the murmur in the air. You sometimes sounding like you. You sometimes saying you. Go nowhere. Be no one but you first. Nobody notices. Only you've known. You're not sick, not crazy, not angry, not sad. It's just this. You're injured. Everything shaded, everything darkened, everything shadowed. Is the stripped, is the struck, is the trace, is the aftertaste. I, they, he, she, we, you were too concluded yesterday to know whatever was done could also be done, was also done, was never done. The worst injury is feeling you don't belong so much to you. Thank you so much. Joshua. Um, we have Claudia's most recent two books, Don't Let Me Be Lonely and Citizen, here. And I believe we might subject her to the pains of signing some of them and talk to both poets. Um, Joshua has a zine here as well. And thank you to University Press Books for manning the book station. And come back next week for Peter Gizzi and then further down the line for Moten and Howe. Thank you. Good night.